Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Aha, uh -huh. I just sent you all an email. Another case I just, just found. Ms. Archer, can you send it to my um, personal email, please? Um, what's your personal? Because I only, only have the bank of the Bahamas on my sheet. Keishala underscore Mackey at outlook.com. Underscore Mackey at Outlook. Okay. Thank you. You're most welcome. Hold on. You got the other ones earlier, right? Today? Uh-huh. What time did you send them? Um, hold on. I send that 9.33 a.m. No, I didn't get that. The only email I got today was from Miguel for the new link. Oh, okay, okay. Um, okay, let me see if I can send you all of those one time there. Thank you. Okay, hold on now. What is it doing? I was just getting ready to put your thing in here. What did it do? Okay. Let me just do it like this one. Okay. Um, the other class members could start to, to read it. It it's um it covers a point that was raised by Ellsworth in the last class. I haven't finished reading it yet, but let me send this to Ms. Archer, what are we reading, please? The case I just sent. Just sent. Okay, thank you. One I just sent. I'm trying to send these to Keishala now because she is missing all of them. Okay, let me start putting these together for you. So it's this one. I have to look for these cases and you all are so always so excited. Elsewhere, you probably would like this one. Good afternoon, my friend. So, te teacher, how are you? <laughs> I am fine. I found this case a few minutes ago, Bank of the Bahamas and, and not Bank of the Bahamas, is it Bank, yeah, Bank of Bahamas and not Bank of the Bahamas, which one that is? Yeah, Bank of the Bahamas. Uh, I'm gonna start what? Oh, Jesus, I need a pen. That's the last one I sent. Okay. Jesus Christ. This. Lawson. Oh. Whoa. You said you just sent it to us, uh, Mrs. Archer? Yeah, just just now. Okay. I, I don't see it as yet. What do you mean? <laughs> I don't know why, but I don't see it. I sent it. Hold on, let me finish her, and then I may have to add you on here. This person was Gibson. Yeah. Gibson. This one here. And what other case I have here? Gibson. Cedar Johnson. Let's see. Okay, let me go back to my list.
How come you don't have it? Do you have another email? Are you I referring said, to me? Yeah, S M I C H E L at B M. Yeah, B M C Homes with an yeah. S H O M E S dot com. But you got it before, right? Um. Yeah. At, I okay. mean, there were times at, at the beginning where I did, it didn't go through. Okay, I'm sending it again. Tell me if you have it. Okay. Hey, Shella, you should have it too. I just sent it again. Thank you, I have it. Good. You said we're reading the case with Scotia Bank and Ricardo Gibson. No, Bank of the Bahamas and Mark Oscar Gibson. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have it now. Okay, good.
Hi, good afternoon, ma'am. How are you? I'm fine. Okay. Eating it? Yeah. Which case are we supposed to be reading, ma'am? Bank of the Bahamas and Mark Gibson. Mark Thank Foster. you very much. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I wasn't hearing anything. Um, are we supposed oh. to be reading? A We're reading um, Bank of the Bahamas and Mark Foster Gibson. Thank you, Mrs. Archer. Okay. That's the last case that I sent. Perfect. Thank you.
Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, Tony. Good night, Tony. We're reading the case of Mark Gibson. Hello, good evening, everyone. Ms. Archer, I was able to make it. So which one is that again we are reading? Ms. Archer, can you hear me? Yes, Bank of the Bahamas and Mark or Oscar Gibson. The last case I sent. Would you say today or yesterday? Yeah. Oh, today. What time was that? A few minutes ago, but one minute before class began. Oh, I didn't see that. Are you able to send it to any k i e l m at gmail.com, please? Hold on, you're riddling too fast. Sorry. I, have to, I have to find paper first. Where you want me to send it? N e k i e l m at gmail.com. N e k i e l m uh -huh. at gmail.com. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, make hold on. Let me know when you get it. I'm about to send okay. it to you. Forward it. What I sent to these here. Okay. N E K I E L M. Yes, ma'am. Email. It's very short, so we should be. It's me? Tony, you should have it. Well, I send it to. Oh, I have it. Okay. I have it. I am still at work. I'm leaving. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just got out of a meeting, so I am on my way home. I should be home within the next ten to fifteen minutes. I can hear you and listen to you, but I haven't read. Okay. All right. That's fine. You just gave us. I receive it, Miss Archer. Okay. Good. Thanks. Couple of pages. Anyone finished reading it as yet?
almost done. Okay, we finished. Almost. I'm finished. Okay, all right. And everybody's finished. Finished. Finish. Not that long. Pages. Okay, so let's start. When we began the course, we looked at what is land law in general in particular to the Bahamas and having unregistered land. Then we move into understanding the conveyancing process. We then look at different types of mortgages, the law relating to mortgages. And now today and Wednesday, we're gonna look at the mortgages and the mortgages duties and liabilities. So we start with the mortgage. We know that 
one of the principal obligation that the mortgager has is to repay principal and interest and any other sums advanced by the mortgagee on demand. And we know that the if he fails to pay the principal and the interest, the mortgagee has the right to pursue a number of legal remedies that we went through in the last class. The mortgagee, in most instances, would likely seek to exercise the statutory and contractual power of sale and sell the mortgage property in order for him to recoup whatever is outstanding, which we have seen in a lot of the cases that we have um, read and discussed. And that would also include any other funds that they have actually expensed for the mortgage property. It should note that the bank service charges owed to it also, all of that becomes a part of the extant, outstanding amount. So you should, it should be noted that the mortgage or is afforded some protection in law when they exercise their power of sale or when the power of sale is exercised by the mortgagee, because the mortgagee has what you call a limited equitable duty to the mortgagor and any guarantor. And that is to take reasonable care to obtain the market value of the property at the date at which it decides to sell. And recall in the last class, the mortgagor decides, the mortgagee decides when they are going to sell. So notwithstanding this equitable duty, the mortgagee does have a duty to take any action to, does not, have to, does not have a duty to take any action to preserve the value of the security in the exercise of the security rights. And that's why you would have seen many years, been a few years back, about three, six, nine, ten 10 years back, when the bank started to apply to the court for vacant possession, and then to exercise the power of sale, a lot of the borrowers decided to go into the homes and start to take out the cabinets, take out the tubs, take out the fixtures out of the building and start to demolish the building before the banks actually um, were able to get vacant possession. So in the exercise of its power of sale, the mortgagee is permitted to exercise such power even though the mortgage may have already agreed to a sale, which would provide sufficient proceeds to pay the whole amount of the mortgage debt. The mortgagee may be prevented from selling the mortgage property under the power of sale if the mortgager has tendered the whole sum before the sale. So even in exercising a statutory and contractual power of sale, and remember when we say contractual power of sale, the power of sale is actually a clause written within the mortgage deed. A mortgagee is not permitted to sell the mortgage property to itself as this would amount to a foreclosure. And you know that a lot of the banks now do not want to sell the mortgage properties to themselves because they don't want these assets on the books. According to the Homeowners Protection Act, the mortgagee shall not sell the mortgage property to any of the following parties. And remember, we discussed this last class also. They cannot sell to the director or an employee of the financial institution as they used to do in the past. Um, they cannot sell to any immediate family member of a director or employee. Any company is beneficially owned by a director or employee or any person who by the nature of the intimate relationship with a director or an employee of the institution would be given favorable consideration because all of that is a sum it up in three words is a conflict of interest. So once the mortgagee has sold the mortgage property under power of sale, it is a trustee of the proceeds. And to avoid a breach of trust action, they have to pay the proceeds as follows. 
any prior encumbrances, the cost of the sale, any monies payable under the mortgage agreement, any subsequent mortgagee, and of course, whatever's left to the mortgage owner. So let's look at our case now with Mr. Gibson, who is challenging the Bank of the Bahamas, saying that he does not owe them any money. Who wants to chime in first? Kristen, you want to start? Okay, Shala, you want to start? My only concern is um, how he was claimed to be under the assumption that he can start paying his mortgage five months later. I don't know. Because <laughs> I don't in here anywhere i don't see how we came to that conclusion because if you if, if we start from paragraph one mm -hmm. his new loan according to his commitment letter brought his indebtedness to three hundred and seven thousand mm -hmm. dollars and he had two loans requiring two separate payments the bank then in 2009 less than three, three years, two and, two, two and a half years later, decided to restructure his loans. Mm -hmm. And in the commitment letter, dated the 26th of May, it reflected the economic circumstances under which restructuring was done. Mm -hmm. So the restructured loan reflected a balance or sum of 305,000 which was to be repaid over a 20 year period and mature on May 30th, 2029. And as the judge said, it could not, it could not mature in May, on May 30th, if you're starting it five months later. Mathematically, it does not compute. Your contract says that your loan matures on May 30th, 2029. So how, did he arrive at that assumption that he had these free months? That's the question I, I, I don't understand because then he comes back and he says, in where, which paragraph was that? Paragraph eight, Gibson says, he relies on an entry in his accounts of the bank, which is identified as principal dispersal but he didn't have a principal dispersal in cash because what they actually did is they did a restructuring. And of course, in the restructuring, principal actually would be changed, but he had not received any additional funds. He said last disbursement made by the bank under the loan facility was made on the 4th of September, 2009. But that cannot be right because when he had the, the whole loan itself restructured, the loan was restructured in May, 2009. So he couldn't have had two restructuring and he didn't have a disbursement because he didn't receive any cash. Monique, what you have to say, but Mr. Gibson. Um, it, it could be a case scenario by Mr. Gibson misunderstood what was taking place. And it probably was probably not properly explained to him. Like when we come to the part of the restructure, <laughs> I know mm -hmm. that, you know, they pay the outstanding interest and they probably had to say, damn, this was the interest that 
had occurred for the period of three to five months. And in his mind, he probably was thinking the loan was paid for that time frame. I mean, that, excuse me, that's how I'm looking at it. But two, I think he was quite aware of what was going on. And he was just trying to see how he could, you know, come up with an argument mm -hmm. to win this case, to win the case. But how? But how? <laughs> when he admitted but, he hadn't paid anything from 2016. <laughs> I, like I say, I guess <laughs> when he think the restructure took place that, you know, this covered everything that what was that happened in the past, that he started up fresh. Okay, so he says in paragraph, okay, let's go to paragraph five. Mm -hmm. Paragraph five, he says he relied on um, the affidavit of Mr. Maycock, a licensed accountant, mm -hmm. who himself, his report doesn't make any sense. That's why I got them all confused. Because if he, if he, if he is a, an accountant, like we know, because it says in nine, Gibson relied on the provision and assessment made by Maycock that he was not in arrears of the loan. But if the loan commenced in May, how could he not be in arrears? Also, it can be a case in there, because I think I see something where he said that monies was on his account. No, you mean when he said principal dispersal? Yeah, so in this man, yes, I'm thinking he could He's get He's looking these. at the wording. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. He could get that mixed up and it wasn't properly explained to him exactly yeah, what it is that Gibson. was going on. But that's Gibson. We're talking now about the accountant who prepared <laughs> this assessment for him. If I paid my money to you as an accountant, to assess my loan and determine whether or not I am in arrears or not. I mean, I don't, I, don't I, I don't think he was really an accountant because if he had all of the information. Yes, he is. <laughs> yes, really? Yes. Because I mean, I know we give a commitment letter and if you have this documentation, so you should be able to come to the court and your information should reflect with the bank ad. Yes, paragraph five say he sent it to an accountant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that. Yes. And what the accountant is, he qualified his assessment of the state of the loan as not satisfying internationally recognized standards. And then he put in his assessment that the, the payments were to commence on the 30th of October and not May 30th. Where in the world would he get October from? Because he took the same wording as saying principal disbursal. But as an accountant, he should know that if you restructure a loan, there is no principal disbursed. No, there's no funds to be disbursed. None whatsoever. And I'm sure Mr. Gibson knew he got no funds. So he himself, the bank says that Gibson didn't pay sufficient funds to satisfy his payments on October 2009, January to March 2010, <laughs> August 2010, October to December 2010, May 11th, August 11th, and then he say he hasn't paid this since 2016. Yep. I think they just let this carry on too long. Perhaps. <laughs> From 2011, that, that was it. You know, the banks, some banks just be very lenient. No, oh, very lenient and you get nothing. <laughs> yeah. No, but there, there's a time you stop because when you look at the mortgages, it's one, one of his, this primary obligation is to pay. And so in all of these periods, he could not pay. After he was restructured, this should have been stopped. True, that is so true after the restructuring stage. Yeah, after you, you restructure, and after the restructuring, if you cannot make the payments, then that's it. Mm -hmm. 
was from 2011 to 2016, five years. This was not bad. But normally what we do, before we do a restructure, we had to have the clients um, either pay three or to five months consistently payment before we restructure loan. You know, just to see and good pay that this is something that they really want to do and they can handle it. Yeah, I know that that's the normal, that's the normal practice. Mm -hmm. And then if for whatever reason he loses his job or his spouse loses his job, then you sit down and you look again and see, can you do a further restructuring? If necessary. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. But but here to me, the mortgagee is at fault. Not, yeah. not saying that he has not saying that they cannot go and put in and say that we want vacant possession and want the property. I'm not talking about that right to do that. I'm just saying this process here was too long. This is too long. You talk about from 2009 to 2020. Hmm. It's too long. Yeah. 11 years. 11 years. They're pursuing this man to make a loan payment of over $3,000 that he could not afford. And that's what the judge is saying in essence. You're just calculating it and just looking at your maturity date. Whenever anyone gets a loan, the first thing you look at is monthly payment, maturity date. Okay, how many payments is that? And you start counting down. But I do not understand how he could fathom that at the end of the day after this decision was made, he actually went to the Court of Appeal. And he appealed this decision, saying that the bank was in, in breach of its contract. And because the bank was in breach, he's saying that the whole contract was null and void and invalid. That I don't understand. If you know you have an obligation to pay and you did not pay for years, And of course, you know, that was dismissed. He wanted to go to the Privy Council and all. And that was dismissed. Again, even though the bank has that, that right to, to exercise this power of sale and also request a vacant possession, you could see in a lot of these instances, by the time they go to court, I think that the banks have been overly lenient in terms of trying to recoup the funds that have been borrowed. Anybody else have any comments? Brianne, what about you? Hi, Ms. Archer. Hey, Mr. Um, Mr. Gibson sounds like he's a bit mental. I don't <laughs> understand how he doesn't understand that he was in breach of his primary obligation to repay this loan. And the technicality, what he trying to, uh, his little misunderstanding, it's so flimsy. And if he wants to advance some argument, he needs to... He need to sue his accountant. That's the only person who I think he has a grievance against. Mm -hmm. Because the, the accountant should have actually worked from a copy of his mortgage deed. The, the, the commitment letter, that's all he needed. This is what he agreed to. All right, Mr. so had Gibson the accountant had been... not led him astray, he might not have been so confident that, you know, that he's not at fault and, and that he had an, a leg to stand on. I don't mm -hmm. think Mr. Gibson had a leg to stand on because he had already had a previous loan. So he couldn't um, pretend even that he didn't quite understand. 
if he was a complete newbie and and it was his first loan, then you know maybe someone could argue the fact that he may not have clearly understood what he was doing or what he was getting himself into. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. And these people are borrowing small sums of money. They're borrowing large sums of money, which they don't qualify for. Well, Mr. Gets not a long run. No, that is it too is long. A, yeah, it, it really dragged on too long. I'm curious as to why they had two separate payments and why they didn't just restructure the whole thing from the beginning and just create one big, you know, lump sum balance and let him pay one payment every month so that he would be clear on everything that was going on from, from jump. Yeah, just rewrite the whole thing in one. Probably could, but I don't think he's confused. I don't think he's confused. He's just trying he, to get out of paying this. Yeah, I was just gonna say he isn't confused, but that's part of his case. So <laughs> he is playing the part very well. Yeah, he's yeah, he's playing the part very well because he admits to not having paid anything on the loan since 2016. You borrowed three hundred thousand dollars from a bank. And you have not, and you admit you haven't paid for it, but still you're saying that the bank breaches contract. I don't understand. Maybe I, I, I just love how you just don't understand, Ms. Acha. Maybe you should spend a week by us and I could bring you, you could see 50 <laughs> or 100 cases like this every day. So I'm not even surprised at how he's acting because on a daily basis, clients come in and they, they get the loan. And then when it's time to pay, they like, but I didn't know. No one told me that. <laughs> no one told me, me that. Let me ask you a question. Um, in your company, when you do restructuring, um, at the right. end of the week, I think, yeah, it was weekly. At the end of the week, do you all sit down and rationalize in front of, not necessarily a panel, but with independent persons from other departments? going through each one of those cases to see whether or not they actually really qualify for a restructuring? No. <laughs> oh, then you see, Next, first look. So I understand what be, when you said Bank of the Bahamas, I was like, well, you know what, let me don't say anything. <laughs> no, no, but no, no, not to say, not to say anything, but the point is that the whole point is you're here to learn and to share. Right. And you could see, just looking at the cases um, from this institution itself, there's a lot of checks and balances not in place. Right, and because they they um, their organization is made up different, like they don't run like Bank of the Bahamas and Bahamas Mortgage. They would not. They don't run like the typical commercial bank, like RBC and the other ladies in here. Maybe they could attest, like how. Yeah, but hold um, on, hold on. When you say one, hold on, hold on. When you say one, the other typical, that that can be right because they're all banks. Right, all banks controls. They do, but some some are governed by different policies. Like they could, okay, like how Monique said that. I know like in, when you go to like RBC or Finco, I mean, or um, what's the bank called? What I bank with? First Caribbean. You know, if you had to restructure a loan, like she said, they would make sure that you're able to pay those payments before they decide that they would restructure the loan with, with us. They, once you fall on hard time, they don't give you, they don't, you don't have to prove that you could pay over like a three month, like for three months straight. That, that's untrue, actually. Um, it's a six month period by us. They have if to they, don't they have to pay, they have to pay consecutive consecutively. Um, the collections department ensures that they can they have to pay but at I, least six months completely and, and on time and everything and fully that before they would good. even consider that sounds um, restructuring. Good, Michelle, but I have watched them do it for other persons where that's not true. So it's a pants. <laughs> on what? 
on who the person is. <laughs> Me move my mic. <laughs> <laughs> no. Now you see why this 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 whole area of mortgages gets really complicated and difficult because in banking the practices supposed to be the same your policies and procedure follow certain rules now when we had the trend where a lot of people started to we had the economic downturn and a lot of people started to be laid off they started working days these bankers sit around the table and they have a discussion. They sit around the table and they also discuss what their final decision is and the steps that they're going to take. So nothing is secret from each bank. You have the domestic and then you have the Canadians. So even if you don't want to send an email or you don't want to um, call someone on the phone, there is a forum where they discuss what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, where they're having difficulties. And what is so amazing is that when you read these cases, there's just so many gaps of internal controls. And then you look at it, like you're saying, even the policies, the policy is the policy. And when there are exceptions, exception has to go to a committee and it has to be documented so that someone else who comes for an exception has to fall within that criteria. So what I don't understand is how this man, okay, what you have to say? Hello? Someone was about to say something. I, I don't understand how he was allowed to, to operate this loan in this manner for so long. I don't understand. But this, this is a, this is hopefully a good example for this bank to look at their procedures when it comes to restructuring. Because something like this should never happen. Uh, hello. Yes, go ahead, Elsewhere. The only suggestion is their receivables uh, section is not working properly because normally these matters are sent to receivables and sometimes they allow these matters because it's not that effective and it's not being driven. Uh, that's how they fall through the crack. And that's how this, this matter probably was allowed to, to linger for so long. But uh, okay, accounts are signed managers and the managers have to work these matters. So between 2011 and 2016, who was managing the account? That's where you start from. And I know, and I know that B, BOB has actually hired um, retirees from the Canadian banks to assist them in putting the proper structure in place and also the system and the way in which things are done methodically and procedurally. And I don't understand how this, how this happens. And then this again shows that in terms of the borrower, that the behemoth people still don't understand their obligation when it comes to a mortgage that their first obligation is to pay that mortgage. Not go on vacation, not play numbers, but to actually pay their mortgage. And I don't think they understand the gravity of that actual mortgage deed when they sign, when they sign that, what those covenants mean. 
and their obligations. So under the under the, the whole under mortgage itself, the mortgager covenants to the mortgagee that he or she beneficially owns the property. And there is an implied promise by the mortgagor has the power to convey the property. And the mortgagor also covenants, covenants as the beneficial owner that the mortgagee is entitled to possession and that the mortgagor will execute further documents to perfect the mortgagee's title if required. And that they won't do anything that will prevent the mortgage from operating according to its terms. With a leasehold, the mortgagor also covenants as a beneficial owner or landlord, that the lease is valid and that all obligations under the lease have been and will be performed. Now, the mortgagor also have after repayment and ownership of the property being given to the mortgagee via covenant, there is insurance. And we know with insurance, I know from the Canadian banks, this was a huge project, huge project. Because you know, Bahamians do not like to insure their property. And most of them, when they insure it, they insure it under the valuation of the property. So the mortgagor is required to insure the property and keep it in good repair and condition. And I told you all, I think it was the second class, how I've seen um, banks have actually repossessed home, ask for vacant possession, then put the house up for sale. And in between the vacant possession and the sale, they allowed the mortgage to remain in the house and they just run it right to the ground. Because as far as they're concerned, the bank is at fault, not them. So if the mortgage or defaults in this obligation, the mortgagee is permitted to do so. They can insure the property. However, the cost, as you know, is added to the debt. It also gives the bank the power to apply the insurance monies in repairing the property and or discharging the debt. The mortgage allows the bank to make payments of the insurance premiums upon which the mortgagor is liable without affecting his or her liability under security. So under the CLPA, a mortgage, a mortgagee where a mortgage is made by deed has the power to insure and keep insured against loss or damage by fire, any building or any effects of property of an insurable nature. Now, I know you all are aware from last year that there's a fault line coming through the Caribbean. Have the banks considered insurance to cover earthquakes? Monique? Anika? I'm trying to remember if I saw any recent um, homeowners quotes because we have to get HOI quotes. I'm trying to remember if I saw any with the with the earthquake um, clause added into it. I just mm -hmm. got a just got a quote today. Let me take a look at it and see. Yeah, because what's going to happen is this. Yes, we have it for fire. Mm -hmm. but what if there is an earthquake? 
how is the bank going to recoup its funds if the coverage is not adequate? Uh, ben, what are the lessons learned from Hurricane Dorian? Ensure your property. How often should the property be appraised to make sure it's not underinsured? Another lesson from Dorian. Yes, another one. But I don't see, I don't see banks talking about the effects of Hurricane Dorian on his mortgage books. See, these are the things you see in other jurisdictions where the bank prints articles that is not only in their interest, but also in the interest of the client, especially when you're talking about mortgage properties. So here I am, my mortgage is 25 years and I'm 15 years down the road. And then something a Hurricane Dorian comes. And I have my loan on my balance on, on the books is 250. Because I built a, a nice mansion. But I have my insurance coverage now is based on maybe say 350, 375. And it doesn't include earthquake. What happens? How, do, how, how, how will the bank recoup its funds? What did you find in your insurance document? Seen anything is um, here? <coughs> Does have, um, hold on, I'm trying to see. Yeah, it just it just has fire and and, and hurricane. Mm. So the base the basics. Okay. Nothing see, in reference to earthquake. Right. So that's what the bank has to look at its portfolio, in terms of coverage. Because remember now, if the mortgage or cannot pay it, then the bank pays it because you're protecting the assets if you want to recoup your funds. And you know, the Bahamians always complain even now, just paying insurance for her again and fire. So the mortgagee, it uh, has a, both a statutory and a commercial I mean, contractual protection in the terms and condition of the, the indenture of mortgage, of its security interest for the mortgage of land. And that's through that power to ensure. That's its protection. And I think banks don't give enough attention to that protection. because it falls on both sides, the mortgagee and the mortgagor. If the mortgagor fails to pay the premium, then the mortgagee is given the power to pay it at the mortgagor's expense. And that's, a, that, that's another thing that need, also needs to be brought to the attention when you, attention when you are now that you have the home, um, homeowner's protection is that when the bank pays insurance on behalf of the mortgage or, I think they need to know. And in this day of technology, a notice should go out to the mortgage or advising. The bank has paid your insurance premium in the amount of so-and-so, which has been added to your debt. 
So at least they were, they were, can't say later on that they were not aware. They still will say that. <laughs> Ms. Oh. Archer, what are your thoughts? Go ahead. What are your thoughts on this situation? Um, the mortgagee did exercise its, its right or its power to pay the insurance premium. The mortgagee rather exercised its right to pay the insurance premium because the mortgager was in default. So they were they were paying the insurance premium good. And then some internal policy in the bank happened and they decided that they were no longer going to pay the premium on commercial property. So they stopped paying the premium for, for this mortgager. Um, the mortgager said they, they weren't notified that the bank had dropped um, the insurance. Hurricane come, the place, the, the mortgage property sustains quite a bit of loss. Who do you, who do you think... Do you think, would you say that the mortgager is still the person that is liable to, uh, or should have kept the premises insured? Well, even though, even though that is one of the obligation of the mortgagor, the, I think the mortgagee themselves also because you, because you have that asset on the books and you want to recoup, should make sure that it is actually insured. Right. At, what is the rationale for not doing it? Well, the, well, the bank's rationale was that they had taken an internal policy that this classification of property, they were no longer going to um, pay the insurance premiums on. But the insurance premium is added on to the mortgage. Is yes, it, it was being added on. Too high? No, the bank is just, the, the explanation that the bank gave to the mortgager is that we made an internal decision that um, rental properties, you have a rental property, and we, we were no longer going to pay premiums for rental properties, only um, dwelling homes. What did the indenture of mortgage state in the, in the covenants? Well, in, in the covenants, the mortgager is, is liable for keeping the premises insured. It doesn't mention anything about the mortgagee in the event no. that the mortgagee doesn't pay? I don't think so. So, but in practice, the, the mortgagee had, had started to pay the insurance and then they just abruptly changed the policy and the mortgager is saying that they didn't know that the bank um, was no longer um, keeping the insurance current. Yeah, because guess what? Even though, even though that is an obligation, even though the mortgager's obligation is to keep the property insured, um, because the bank, by practice, over the years, any borrower knows that if it happens, the bank will pick it up. So if you're gonna change a policy, you need to advise your clients. That's only fair. Agreed. And, and again, I'm saying the banks are, are it's, it's, just, it's just a lot of loopholes and the loophole is costing the bank on one side. And of course, by not informing the clients, the clients suffer in the end. But they should have informed them. But here, here again is where um, the mortgager is supposed to take responsibility for um, its indebtedness to the bank. We, we tend to try and throw everything on the bank. Well, the bank didn't do this, the bank didn't do that. It's not the responsibility of the bank to pay your insurance. Correct. One of the securities when you sign up for a mortgage, one of the securities that are supposed to be in place is 
HOI over the property for the duration of the mortgage. That's the responsibility of the mortgager. The bank will only step in if they see they don't get the information that they're supposed to get annually from the client to say that the insurance has been taken out. Now, um, albeit, yes, it's the bank's property until the client pays back every dime. And so if they see that the customer isn't paying it, then the bank should um, take the insurance out. But it's also the responsibility for the client. If you're not able to pay it, and you're assuming that the bank is going to pay it for you to follow with the bank and make sure that it's paid because it's your responsibility to ensure that coverage is made annually and proof of that coverage is provided to the bank. This is where we have a fall down in this society where um, Bahamians like to go and borrow and don't live up to their responsibilities and their expectations. And then they want to turn around and throw everything on the bank. Oh, the bank didn't tell me this. Oh, the bank didn't tell me that. Just like you would have said last class. And one of the things that I say to my customers, especially when you've had a mortgage on the books for a while, you need to make sure that your mortgage is being paid. You need to make sure that every penny that you said you're putting on this loan is going to the loan. So you make yourself accountable and go to the bank and get your statements to show that okay, my payments are going through to my loan. And that's, that's what it is. Be as Bahamians, be as people that walk in the bank and borrow the people's money, need to make sure that we make ourselves accountable for the things that we um, say we are going to, to do. Agreed, agreed. But my only point I was making was that if the bank has been doing it, especially talking about commercial clients, you probably have big properties. I would think that that loan, that account manager would have communicated something to the client. Even though it is the obligation because at the end of the day, the bank has an asset on, on, on the books. And if something was to happen, even though you would say that it's the mortgage owner now who has to pay the, pay the funds to recoup, if you had insurance, then you'll be able to recoup something. So it's, a, it's like a it's like a it's, it's like a, a a balancing and you're juggling. Anyone else have thoughts? The other thing, I think in, in such circumstances like this, it goes to the efficiency also of the, the, the bank or its offices, because if you have, let's say, for instance, you have a property in, you, now you have Bahama out east, right? Out west. Mm -hmm. out west. Mm -hmm. Before Bahama went there, I remember a friend had a condominium and when Bahama went there, the property value soared through the roof. And so... Here you have this, this um, uh, asset that the bank actually owns, not the mortgage or, and it's soaring in value. And for instance, let's say the property burns down or whatever have you, uh, or something happens, the bank stands to gain much more if there's this due diligence to ensure that the property is, is properly insured. I think the, the primary responsibility for insuring the property is indeed, in fact, the mortgage or. But in certain circumstances, the, 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 the agent in the bank has that duty to be vigilant, to ensure, because I never even thought about, I'm a lawyer and I never even thought about, I had a mortgage for about 12 years now, to go and reevaluate my home in case something happens because you want yes. it to be repaired. Uh, mm -hmm. To have it repaired, something happens. And then there's this whole thing now, is if your home is considered to be undervalued, the bank would then pay you, uh, but not, you know, I think, help me if I'm, if I'm wrong. If you, if, you, if you don't show your property to the proper value, you can't expect the bank to come and assist you if you only insure it for $200,000. So yeah, the primary responsibility is that of the mortgage job, but there is an asset that the bank owns, which uh, inures to the benefit of shareholders. 
And so if you have agents in the bank, I think, and you have, uh, and, they're not, and, if, and they're not doing their due diligence, it's where the bank should have checks and balances to ensure that its managers are really functioning to their optimum to protect his assets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because remember, at the end of the day, everything is the bottom line. So when you look, if, if there is a disaster, and then you look at your assets on the books, and there is no insurance coverage, and the persons are not working, how is the bank going to recoup its funds? That's why I say it's a juggling thing. You have to make a decision. So is this policy, the policy going forward, it was only for during that economic recession or the pandemic? Or this is just straight across, this is the policy? Well, I'll say to you that in instances like that, because uh, I worked for First Caribbean for 20 years, and um, I was in an area where we did a lot of, you don't pay your insurance, we can pay it for you. And yeah. so, like, after a three-year period, if the, uh, if, if the appraisal on the books was three years or older, yeah, um, you we would one. send for a new appraisal, and you're going to cover that cost, so that gets added to your to your mortgage, just as the the um, insurance premium is going to get audited. But again, I, I, I put this back on the mortgager because all of this is built into your commitment letter. And all of this, <clears throat> this is things that we, as if we're gonna go and we're gonna get a home, this is things that we need to take into account. Um, over time, the value of the property is going to change. So why not after about three years, five years, I shouldn't go and get my property revaluated so that I can make sure that I have it insured for the correct amount. Because if you're going to pay insurance, you want to know that if you have to use the insurance, if you have to go and make that claim, that you're going to be getting what you, what you need to, to bring your building back to the state that it was or to take it to a better place. And so getting a building in 2000, and having it evaluated at one thing, and it's 2020 and you now claim insurance, I can guarantee you that building is undervalued. And so again, like I said, put it back on the mortgage. We have to take responsibility and be accountable for, for these things. So Mr. Johnson, I will say to you, go and get your house evaluated, sir, and take, it, take the appraisal to the insurance company so that you can make sure you covered. I agree. Uh, I'm going to do just that, and I'm mm -hmm. happy them in this course. I think, and I agree with you, but where is the primary responsibility of the mortgage? If there's an asset that's really the legal title is with the bank, mm -hmm. the mortgagee, and and I think the offices in the bank has a as a as a as a, a fiduciary responsibility uh, to ensure that the asset that they own, because I'm in this house, I don't really own this house. No. And so if I fall down, if I'm negligent in not going to have it, have it um, uh, properly assessed, then there, there is the duty, like you said, in your bank. Very good. Where you say after three years, we, you, you will do that assessment. That was put in place because there was, they probably had an experience where they had assets that they own. Because at the end of the day, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if I'm a shareholder and I'm seeing that the bank is not and, and you know, that, that was the argument, <clears throat> and I'll say this because I know this is a class for the Bank of the Bahamas when lawyers and even judges saw how the Bank of the Bahamas was run, <clears throat> right? And mm -hmm. this is, the, the suggestion was made, to say, who are, who are the managers? They have a fiduciary responsibility to protect the interests of the bank and the, and the shareholders. What were they doing when this bank was slipping? And so even in terms of the assets being the property, even if the mortgagee, I mean, the, the mortgager falls down and, and let's say I don't go and do this. At the end of the day, if I'm a shareholder and I see, wow, this Ellsworth Johnson house is now next door to Bahama. And a house that was once 500,000 is now 5 million. And because we weren't doing, you weren't doing your due diligence, I lost as a shareholder an extra, say, 50,000. There's an action that I may have against the bank. 
Mm-hmm. And what you see happening in First Caribbean and those other banks is because in other parts of the world, when these things happen, shareholders step forward. As a matter of fact, uh, managers are sent to prison when they cause these type of losses. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, you're right, Ellsworth. But then, you know, like I was saying again, because these things are happening, no one is sitting back and trying to say, okay, what did we do wrong? Especially after these matters go to court. What did we do wrong? Because I'm sure the legal department get copies of these um, judgments. So why aren't they sitting back and making corrections to their policies and procedures and rethinking? Because what else we're just saying is that when we look at it now, we're looking at the, the indenture of mortgage, the, the, the mortgage or the mortgagee and their obligations. But what he's saying is that's at that level. But when that board sits around the table, they're not, they're not looking at the mortgage or didn't um, insure, oh, the bank said that's the mortgage or's obligation. No, they didn't do it. They're looking at the assets of the book. How much is it going to cost the bank to carry that asset? Because it affects the actual holders' value. Your house, because the insurance is, is based on the replacement value of your home. Property, we don't insure a property and ju just a building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're correct. Mrs. Archer. Yes. Um, I know with us, we offer a blanket homeowner insurance to all of our um, clients. And the reason we do that is to ensure that the homes are insured, um, you know, and there's no, you know, lapsing or whatnot, but it does take a lot of managing of that process in order to do that. But I'm concerned with the fact that if um, I, as a client, I'm shopping around looking for a financial institution to, you know, apply for a mortgage at. The fact that with Bank A, I may be able to rely upon them often me you know a very inexpensive home I know year um or or if I don't they're gonna then apply it to the principal balance of my mortgage right Mm -hmm. Now, if a bank starts out offering you that and you take that into consideration, you say, okay, this seems reasonable to me. I'm going to go with this. And then they change in midstream and all of a sudden they decide, oh, policy change here. We're not going to do it anymore. I don't think it's really fair because if you, you know, sign your contract with that understanding in mind and, and agreeing to it, it kind of alters the situation. For the client, maybe not for the banking institution, but is is that reasonable to do that when you know you you set that out with an understanding at inception? Yeah, but that's what I was saying. When the bank changes its policy and it affects affects the borrower in terms of expending more funds, even though you even though you know in the mortgage, um, uh, it says that the mortgager has this obligation. So, but the mortgager expects, based upon what you've been doing all along, that you will continue doing it. And so it's not budgeted. Now you decided you're stopping it. It is it, a whole revaluation of how they're going to disburse their funds. And then that, and sometimes because now the, the, the borrower has to 
try and find that insurance money, you find out sometimes they're going to go in default because they're trying to save that money or they're trying to borrow from somewhere else in order to pay that insurance premium because the insurance is high. Those premiums are very high. So it's just some food for thought for you all to think about when you, when you sit around the table and you're looking at mortgages and you're looking at the assets and you're thinking about insurance and the things that can possibly happen. And what will the bank do? Now, maintenance and upkeep of the mortgage property. The mortgager is also required to pay all rates, assessments, stamp duty, charges, and real property taxes applicable to and affecting the mortgage property. And that includes utilities, taxes, and other charges. Now, I know that they are still trying to collect real property tax. And I know when they had the amendment to, to the, the um, Real Property Act in terms of mortgages, the mortgagee, making sure that the mortgagee pays all the real property tax, there was a lot of pushback because the banks felt that, hold on now, the government believe we're supposed to be collecting tax for them. Because I know in some banks, they started, they started doing a project first with commercial um, loans. And going through each one of those files to confirm whether or not real property tax was paid, if not paid, what is outstanding, and then whether or not it could be added on to the loan if the bank paid. So again, what's your take on that one? Maintenance and upkeep of the mortgage property. Because there are still a lot of real property tax outstanding. Um, yes, yes, there Mark. is. There is. Mm -hmm. I, um, like you said, yeah, the government has um, put it on the lending institution to assist them with collecting um, a standard real property tax. But the only way we can, like mortgages that were already on the books, the only way we can recoup, like say, for instance, if they come in for a further charge, that's when we would then be asked them to bring in the real property tax report and when that is presented. Our next case scenario will be like when they pay their mortgage off in full and mm -hmm. you have to provide the real property tax report showing a zero balance before we can do the satisfaction of mortgage for them. Yeah, but because I know based on a project that I did, by the time we were finished with the commercial loans and the amount of real property taxes was outstanding, it was in the millions. And that included properties that were up for sale or properties where you've had foreigners who would have borrowed funds and then just dropped the projects and just left. And you always have to be mindful that as a mortgager, you have to upkeep the property. That's painting, replacing. It has to, the, the, the property has to appreciate in value and not, not devalue. And of course, as a mortgager, you have, you have an obligation to inform the bank if there are any encumbrances or encroachments or nuisance or disputes. Or if, if, you, if someone comes around and it's from Ministry of Wake to say they're doing some rezoning, you have to inform the bank. 
again because the property is mortgaged. And that is the security that the bank is holding and the bank has an interest in that property. So even if you're in the house and you decide you have a mortgage, but you have a buyer and you want to sell it, you have to seek the bank's prior approval to do so. So last week we looked at the Homeowners Protection Act. I want you to look, if, I don't know if you had a chance to read the case of RBC and the halls, Lawson Hall and Rhonda Hall. This is also short. You had a chance to read that one? Nobody? No, ma'am. What, what I could do with you? <laughs> so I'm supposed to be eager and excited. Okay. You know, I did read it, but no, I can't remember what it was about. Um, <laughs> jog my memory. <laughs> Let me start first with the rights of the mortgage or So. Oh, I, re I remember now. They you did remember? not give the halls um, notice. They they sent it through general mail, uh, and um, they were the halls were able to rely. I think it was Section Four of the Home Owners Protection Act that they yeah. did not get their thirty days notice before the uh, the um, the action was initiated. Mm -hmm. Because the bank sent the wife's notice. With the general right? delivery. Yes. When they yeah. when they were ready to go to court, they knew the exact address to put on the documents. Yes. And it was prominently placed, and it was the same law firm who um sent the notice that, that initiated the action. So they obviously were privy to their, their proper address. Uh-huh. So now we move from the accountant making mistakes now to the law firm making mistakes. So the Homeowners Protection Act has three main features. The obligation of the mortgagee to give notice prior to instituting any proceedings. And that's what happened in the Hall's case. Or their non-traditional power of sale. <clears throat> the second feature is it the right of the mortgage ought to apply to the court for relief. And thirdly, the power of the court to grant relief to the mortgage or. <coughs> the fourth um, feature relates to the long-standing enduring nature of judgments. Under section 23 of the act, it says, no mortgagee shall recover from any mortgage or any sum owing under any judgment by the court for the repayment of any sums void by the mortgage or <coughs> from the mortgage or after the expiry of six years. <coughs> I think a lot, a lot will not be paid. Six years goes very quickly. <coughs> and they say that this is a significant triumph for mortgagors who will no longer be saddled with an outstanding judgment hanging over their heads forever. <coughs> so my question to you all is now, since the act came into being, that's 20, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So this is four years. How many judgments do you have <coughs> that are still out there? Not acted upon since 2017. Has anyone done an assessment of that in your bank? So you can see from the cases we've read where the banks were granted vacant possession and they could exercise their power of sale and the persons are still sitting in the house because they're going through the judicial system. So after 2017, there's six years. And after that, that's it. 
how will that impact the banks? Because there are penalties and there are breaches. Because it says it's equally a hard pill to swallow for lending institutions who either suffer losses when shortfall and such sales occur or where they cannot dispose of properties due to depressed economic conditions. And that's why you see the banks did those wholesale um, packaging of, of distressed properties. So whenever the mortgager is in breach of the mortgage agreement, section four, subsection one, outlines the specifics that must be included in writing to the mortgagor prior to the mortgagee instituting legal proceedings. And the notice must be served personally or by registered post upon the mortgagor at least 30 days prior to instituting the proceedings. Upon receiving the notice, the mortgage or, or member of the family who has been contributing payment to the, to the prior to the breach can apply to the court for relief. So let me ask you, if you have someone who is contributing towards the payment, what evidence do you need to prove that they were paying towards the mortgage? A salary, deduction would be good. Hmm? a salary deduction would be good. But can they get a salary deduction for a mortgage that's not in their name? No, they can't. Okay. Yes, you can. You, you, you can. You can. You can. You can an individual can assign a deduction to someone else. And what is what is the what does the document say? What does that document say? What document are you referring to? I'm not on the mortgage and I'm signed. I'm I'm I have a loan deduction from my salary to pay a part of that mortgage. The, the bank would just give you a deduction. The bank would give you a deduction letter. Now, whatever whatever agreement you enter into with the bank would be in a new commitment letter. But yes, you can assign a deduction from someone else's salary um, to uh, facilitate payment to a mortgage that they're not on. Why, why wouldn't you make them a guarantor instead? Well, I guess that's an agreement that you, the bank would have to come into with the individual. It, it all depends on what agreement was made. But like I said, if, if someone wants to, like um, in instances I've had um, husbands that weren't on mortgages with, um, wives, like I came into a, into a marriage with someone that already had a, a, a mortgage and they, something happened and they needed some assistance and the bank wanted to restructure. And I, as the good husband that I am, went and say, okay, I will allow you to take a portion of my salary by deduction and you just sign off on the deduction letter, take it into your employer and it comes to the bank. It happens. Mm. It happens the with parents. Thing is, if they do it, they, they lock themselves in. It happens with the parents parent. too who, who fall into like a rare situation and then they they have like, you know, children who are working. Exactly. And then the child may step up and say, well, I have at this job at a, you know, a reliable um, employer. 
um, I can do a salary reduction to make sure that the mortgage is paid so it doesn't fall into arrears. Mm -hmm. And that usually happens when um, it's a restructuring going on. Okay, I see. I'm just thinking on, on, the, on the side for this family member who has paid money. And then the person writes a will and it's not, it's, it's not, it's not devised to them. Then they want to sue for what they have paid on the loan. Oh, it's messy. That's a messy one. So the court could consider the request if the family member um, wants to apply to the court for relief. And within six months, if they're able to pay principal and interest. Remember in the first case, how much time did the man ask for? Not six months, Mr. Gibson. Then he asked for 240 days. So you wanted 240 days to pay. A remedy to remedy a default consisting of a breach or pay arrears. So the court may for a period up to six months adjourn the proceedings or give a judgment or make an order for delivery of possession of the mortgage property. And, or at any time before the execution of the judgment or order either suspend the execution of the judgment. So where a mortgager is in breach of the mortgage agreement, section seven, two of the act, Spec, um, specifics that must, the specifics that must be included in writing to the mortgagor prior to the mortgagee exercising his power of sale. And again, the notice must be served personally or by registered post. Upon receiving the notice, the mortgagor, or again, a member of the family who's been contributing to paying the mortgage, may within 28 days of service apply to the court for relief to postpone the sale. The power of the court to grant relief in this instance is laid out in section nine and the court may make an order to postpone the sale of the mortgage property for a reasonable period where it appears that the mortgager is likely to either pay any sums due under the mortgage, remedy a default or pay arrears. And section four, five, six, seven, and eight and nine do not apply to any legal proceedings that existed before the Home Owners Protection Act came into force. Now there are other rights and entitlements under the Home Owners Protection Act for, for the mortgage or discharge from all liabilities for sums due at the date of sale. The mortgage's liability for any residual sums owing at the date of the sale of the mortgage property may be eliminated. And the mortgagee's right to pursue an action for the debt may be jeopardized given the provisions of section 11.8 of the act, which states that, save for any surplus amounts referred to in subsection seven, the exercise by the power of sale shall discharge the mortgage or from any and all liabilities for any sums due under the mortgage if at the date of the sale, a sum equal to at least one half of the principal and accrued interest has been paid to the mortgagee or the mortgagor has been in occupation of the dwelling house for a period not less than 50% of the original mortgage term. Have any of you seen the impact of that on the balance sheet?
Because this is saying that if the house is valued at 250 and no, the balance on the loan is 250 and you're able to sell the home for 200, then they're saying here that the mortgage or is discharged. Under section 11, the mortgage owner may make an offer to purchase the mortgage property at the market rate prior to the mortgagee accepting an offer to purchase the said property. The mortgagee has the right to request in writing a mortgage installment free of charge up to twice a year. And the mortgagee must respond within 30 days of receipt of the request and failure to do so without a reasonable cause, any rights that it may have for the enforcement of the debt will be suspended until they have actually complied with the request for statements. The act also says that the mortgagor at their own expense, they may retain and instruct an attorney chosen by them from a list of attorneys approved by the mortgagee. He may also select an appraiser of his own choice from a list provided by the mortgagee containing at least 12 names of appraisers or assessors who have been approved by the relevant minister. The mortgagee may select an insurance broker registered under the Insurance Act. So where a mortgagee exercises his entitlement under section 17, and that is the right to transfer the mortgage loan to another lender, the mortgagee must assign or convey the debt to the new lender without requiring the mortgagor or the new lender to pay any costs associated therewith. Under section 18, if a mortgagee transfers, assigns, or sells the mortgagee's debts, the mortgagee must advise the mortgagee in writing not less than 30 days before the effective date of the transfer, assignment, or sale. So if you recall when they had the bulk sale, which is about what, four years ago, a lot, a lot of the mortgagors complained because the, the company that purchased the bulk sale had already started to contact them and they didn't know that that happened. The notice must be served either personally or by registered post. And then it tells you what the notice should include the effective date of the mortgage debt transfer, assignment or sale, the name and address or contact number for both the current mortgagee and the transferee, assignee or purchaser, a statement that the transfer of the mortgage debt does not adversely affect any terms or conditions of the mortgage agreement. The transferee, assignee or purchaser must not vary the rate of interest applied to the mortgage debt with the effect that it is higher than the interest rate prior to the transfer, require the mortgage or to pay fees, administrative or otherwise, or charges with or rising from the purchase of the mortgage debt, or offer the mortgage or new payment terms that place the mortgage in a worse position than he would have been had his mortgage debt not been paid. So that's the homeowner's protection and the rights of the mortgagors. So our class on, on Wednesday, we're gonna look at the mortgagees, duties and liabilities as a bank itself. And then we'll also look at the case of Scotiabank and the Gibsons and Finco and Ms. Johnson. Any questions? Is my class awake? No question, Ms. Nacho. Y'all fall asleep. <laughs> All right. So for next class, read those two cases and read um, module six. If I find any other cases, I will send it. Okay. Okay. Hey, Ms. Archer. Yes. Where can we find a recording of this class? I thought Miguel sent an email. 
I think he sent, he sent the first two or three, if I'm not mistaken. I'll, I'll tell him. I'll, I'll tell him to send the rest. Okay. Thank you. I'll tell him. Okay. Thank you. All right. Not a problem. Send him a note tonight. Okay. Okay. What was right. the second case again, Ms. Archer? You mean for Wednesday? Yeah, you said Bank of Nova Scotia and the Gibsons, and what was the other one? Finco and Teresita Johnson. Okay, thank you. Okay. And everybody should have those. And if I find any more, hopefully I'll see the right email addresses. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So okay. have a good evening. You okay. Good evening. Good night. Good night. Good evening, all. Good evening. Good evening, Ellsworth. Good night. Good night. <laughs>